In this short video, we're going to jump into 12 tips for learning Python in VS Code. I recently had the pleasure of helping my favorite student, my daughter, debug some Python code using VS Code. Along the way, it became clear that most beginner Python programmers could benefit greatly by learning a few of the best tools and shortcuts in VS Code. This resulted in the following 12 VS Code features that I recommend for beginners. First, we'll look at the shortcuts cheat sheet, how to open it and access it. Then we're going to use the integrated terminal in VS Code. We're going to access code from the terminal, whether it's the VS Code terminal or your system default terminal. We're going to look at the shortcut for commenting code. We're going to use F2 for refactoring or variable renaming. F5 to launch your program in debug mode. And we're going to create a launcher file so we can create custom configurations. We're going to look at using the debugger with breakpoints and then some of the shortcuts for stepping through code. We're going to talk a little bit about line navigation, just moving your way through a file. We're going to talk about file navigation, switching between files within your project. And then we're going to take a look at the WSL and SSH add-ons if you need to access a Linux machine from Windows or somewhere else. The 11th thing we're going to look at is Python virtual environments. And then finally, we're going to take a quick look at code formatters and linters. This video also has a companion article over on Medium. Find the link in the description of the video. All right, so now we're over in VS Code, and this first tip is kind of like the master tip to unlock the rest of them. VS Code includes a list of all the common shortcuts, and it's easily accessible from the menus. You can just go to Help, and then look at the keyboard shortcuts reference, and this is going to open a new tab, and that will open up this shortcut cheat sheet. There's even a shortcut to open up the shortcut cheat sheet, if you can remember it. It's Control-K, then Control-R, and if you do that, it will open up your shortcut cheat sheet. Note that all these shortcuts are for Windows. The Linux version is going to be basically the same, but for Mac, you want to go to the Mac version of the cheat sheet, which I also have a link for in the article. At first, the sheet can seem overwhelming. As a new VS Code user, you can start by just looking over the sheet and identifying a few interesting shortcuts to start integrating into your workflow. Only choose a few to learn at a time, and as you integrate the shortcuts, revisit this sheet from time to time to find new time-saving shortcuts. Now let's move on to our second tip. We want to access our terminal from VS Code, and you can see that mine is already open here because it just normally is. But by default, you don't normally see this when you first open up VS Code. And the way to toggle this terminal down in the bottom is Control and Backtick. And the Backtick is the key that's to the left of the one key on most standard keyboards. This is an extremely helpful feature in VS Code because it allows you to spend more time in here without navigating away to other tabs. So when you need to run commands or create new files, just come down here to the terminal and go from there. You also want to check out some of the other features, like you can use a split terminal, and if you hover over this, you see the shortcut, Control shift 5 You can click this button, or you could Control shift 5 and you will get a split terminal. To close a terminal, you can just type exit. So in addition to splitting the terminal, you can completely make a new terminal, which is Control shift backtick So if you already have something running on your first terminal, Control shift backtick will create a new terminal. For our third item, we want to look at running code from the terminal. This is pretty easy because all you have to do is go to any terminal on your system and type the word code. If you're not already in VS Code, this will open VS Code. So here we have just a regular terminal. If you type code here, it will just open VS Code. So now you can see we have a new copy of VS Code open. You can create a new file. So I could say code new.python. It's actually going to create a new file uh, with that name. And I'm just gonna close this instead of saving it. Something that tends to happen a lot is you want to either navigate to a project directory or create a new project directory. So I'm actually just going to make a new folder called tempdir, cd my way into there. And then if I say code dot, dot is the current directory. So this is gonna open VS Code with this directory as the project for the, the directory tree structure. So you can see that over here. So now I'm inside of this directory. And anything that I create here, so let's just create a main.py. If we go back here and list out, now you can see that this directory is what is being used in VS Code. One of the most common things that you're going to do with that code command is actually use it inside VS Code, where you'll just open the terminal, type code, and then a new file name. So we're going to open temp2.py, save it, and now we just have another Python file inside of our project. And for me, that is the easiest way to create a new file, even though I'm sure there's other shortcuts for it. I always do it from the terminal. The next command that I want to look at is using 
a shortcut to comment out your code. Normally, when you want to comment out some code, you would navigate there and then not do your C++ shortcut, <laughs> but uh, you would navigate there and you would comment out that code. But there's a much easier way and it's just hitting control slash. So control slash just toggles commenting out. You can do multiple lines by highlighting multiple lines. So after that, we want to try using F2 for variable renaming. So this say instead of X, I wanted to call this I. Now it's like, okay, well, I have to put I here. And now these don't work. So I put I here, etc. You can see that that is very time consuming and terrible. So what you want to do is just get your cursor next to the variable that you want, or you can highlight the variable and press F2. Now this rename window comes up. And if I want to rename it to I, you can see it renamed it in all four places where I'm using it. Note that this is an extremely powerful tool in VS Code and can be used to rename classes, objects across multiple files. After using this feature, don't be surprised if you see changes in other files. And what I'm doing here is actually kind of dangerous. So I'm, re I'm going to rename this thing that we're importing to a better variable name instead of some bad variable name. And you can see that it renamed it in this file, but I'm importing it from temp. So what happened over there? So you can see that it renamed inside of temp as well which is fine because these are both my code files. And if I wanted to change the name to better variable in both files, that's fine. You just have to understand that if you're importing something from another place, you rename it, or even if I renamed it down here, and I showed that I renamed it up here on the import to make it clear. But when you're down here, if you try to rename this thing, it's not only going to rename it here, it's going to rename it in the other file as well. So this is, is powerful and can be kind of dangerous. For our sixth item, we're going to take a look at F5 and the launcher file. In VS Code, just go to the program that you want to run and press F5. You'll be presented with some options. Normally, you're just going to want to run the current file. So you just press Enter, and then it will run this current file that's already selected. But if you're running an application, maybe you want a different launch configuration. But for us, uh, all we need to do is push enter and it's going to run the current Python file and you can see our output down here. So it ran as expected. We go back, we press F5 again and it actually just runs and this is new and it's kind of assuming that the last choice we made is the choice we're going to make next time. But if you exit VS Code, when you come back, that's actually not going to be set up anymore. So every time you come back, you have to run this and you have to make that choice again. So that actually gets kind of annoying. And what you want to do to avoid that is go over to your debug area and click this create launch.json file and it's going to present you with the same options. And then we're, since we're just running a Python file, we'll select the Python file. And now you can see that it generated this launch.json file and this lives in our .vs code folder. So anytime you need to edit this, just go to .vs code and then launch.json. And here it actually shows you how it is going to launch your program. But you can add additional things if you end up setting environment variables. You can come in here and then you can add environment variables or an environment file. There's all sorts of options that you can do with this configuration for launching your Python program. But in general, you don't want to modify this unless you know you have a reason to modify it. You do want to create this so every time you close VS Code and come back in here, you no longer have to actually choose the default behavior. So now you just come in here and press F5 and it runs your program. So now we have a default debug launcher uh, configuration set up. Now let's jump into item number seven and actually start using our debugger. So the easiest way to start using the debugger is to just mouse over to the left side of the lines and you'll see these red dots. Let's say we want to stop every time just before the print statement. So now I push F5, it launches us in debug mode. You can see it opened up the debug window here. And now we haven't performed the print line yet. So what we do is you push F5 and it will continue running your program until you hit the next breakpoint. So after you push F5 to run your program, you just push F5 to continue running it. And you can see we printed out the zero. We press F5 again, it's going to print out the one, et cetera, et cetera. Every time it hits this breakpoint, it just stops execution of your program. And what this is good for is it allows you to come in here and explore. Because now when you mouse over a variable, it will show you the current value. You can also set a watch. So anytime, instead of having to mouse over a value, you can just set a watch over here. So now every time the value of i changes, we'll actually see it update over here in the watch area and we don't have to mouse over that variable. That's really enough just to get started with debugging. But when you want to have a little bit more control over this, 
let's let's add a function call here and show you some of the other things you can do. So instead of calling print, we're actually going to call a custom function called myPrint. So we have our short program here with a function call. Let's press F5 to run it. Now, whenever we print, I'm going to push F5 again, and you can see that it loops all the way around back to the next breakpoint, just as expected. There is another shortcut here, which is F10. So F10 just goes to the next line of code. So you can see that we're executing this thing one line at a time. So now we're, we're going to increment I, we're going to check if I is less than 10, then we're going to print the value. However, you see that we're not able to debug this. We're doing a function call here, but it actually just executes it and jumps over it. You can also step into it. So when you're on this line with the function call, you can press F11 to step into the function call. Now you can see that we stepped into the function and we're actually debugging inside of this other function. I don't want to step into the print function. so I'm going to press F10 to just run to the next line and then it continues. So F10 goes to the next line. F10 goes to the next line. If I want to go into this function, I press F11. And if I just want to continue running, I press F5. Finally, if, you, if you're done debugging and you don't actually need this thing to continue running, you can press Shift F5 and it will stop running your debugger. So you can see we just exited the program and we're ready to continue coding. The final shortcut that I want to mention is that, of course, you don't have to come over here and click this. All you have to do is press F9. So if you, if you navigate to a line of code and press F9, then you will have a breakpoint set there. So you can toggle breakpoints with F9. The next item I want to look at is line navigation. This is a pretty simple one. So instead of scrolling around in your window and clicking to the line that you want to go to, like if I'm here and I want to modify the function and I jump up this way, then that's kind of slow, right? So what I could do is press Control G and I go to a line. I want to go modify that print statement. So I'm going to go to line two. And now we're on line two. We can edit things. And then if I want to go back, I can just do another Control G, go back to line eight. And then very similar and Control G, go to line one. This is a common one. Like if you want to modify your imports, you're just jumping to line one uh, to import date time or something like that. This is going to be a common thing to do. And then if you want to go back to where you jumped from, now I have to look and say, oh, well, now it's line nine. But instead, you can just press Alt and the left arrow key, and it will jump you back to where you came from. You see that I'm, I'm toggling back through my jumps. It doesn't keep up with the line changes, but I'm using Alt left and right to navigate between the jumps that I made. Alt right is go forward. Alt left is go back. These are, this is just a powerful navigation tool that will allow you to jump back and forth through your previous line jumps. And I recommend doing this over doing another separate control G to jump. If you go make a change, just jump back using alt left. It saves you a little bit of time. You don't have to look at the line number for where you came from. Okay, now let's take a look at file navigation. So normally if I wanted to go to the temp file, I grab the mouse, go here. I want to go back to main, go here. If temp file is closed, it's even worse. I have to go to the explorer, find the temp file and open it. And there's a much easier way, and you just want to press Control P and start typing the file name, or you can select it off this menu with your arrow keys if that's faster. But I know I'm going for the temp file, so I just type temp and then it works. If I want to open temp2, then it's temp2 and it's open. As soon as you're done editing a file, you can actually press Control W and it will close it for you. Again here, Control W closes the file. Control W closes the current file. Control P if I want to go back to main. If I want to open tab or temp, go control P temp, and that's it. So you use control P, start typing the name of the file, and then open the file. When you're done editing, use control W to close it. And then if you wanted to quickly navigate between these two, you could still do this. You could do main and then temp, but when there's only two, you can actually use control tab to toggle between the open files, right? But let's get a third file in here. And now every time I control tab, I, have, I am tabbing through three files. And this quickly gets out of hand. If you have more than about, you know, three, more than, basically if you have more than three files, it starts getting cumbersome and you just want to actually jump straight to the file. There's also a better way to navigate through code if it's all your code. So let's go back to, let's import temp or from temp, from temp, import uh, better variable name. I'm just adding some extra code here to get rid of these warnings. You can see that my formatter is going to yell at me when I import things and don't use them, and it's going to yell at me when I don't format my code properly. So the better way to navigate is going to be F12. Let's say I'm down here editing inside my while loop, and I want to jump to the code 
for my print function. You can right click and you'll see the option to go to the definition and that takes you here to where you defined my print. So you probably saw the shortcut, it's F12. You just go here, modify your code, you can alt back and it'll take you back to where you came from. And you can also navigate files like this. So if you hover over this variable, you can press F12 and it will actually take you to the other file where it was defined and modified. You can just see how it works. If you need to make changes here, make your changes, press Alt left, and you will jump back to your code where you came from. So this is the preferred way to navigate between files. You want to use F12 to jump somewhere, Alt left to jump back. And then once you're here, you can actually use Alt left and right to continue jumping. The editor keeps track of the jumps that you have made, and you can use Alt left and right to navigate through them. This is by far the superior way to navigate through your code files while you're working on a project. This one is actually extremely powerful. So if we go back and import fast API again, we can actually jump to this code. We, we wouldn't be allowed to modify the name of this, but if you press F12, it actually jumps you into their code to show you what is happening. And you definitely don't want to modify anything in here, but this can be very helpful when you're trying to figure out what something is doing. So now that we're into fast API, we can say, oh, it uses starlight requests, request. Let's go take a look at this. And then you can F12. And now I'm inside a starlight. And if I want to jump up to the top of this to see what imports this uses, oh, it uses JSON and typing cookies. So we can go take a look at what JSON is and F12 this thing. And like, so now we're like, we've really gone down the rabbit hole on what this code is and how it works. And you don't want to modify any of this because it's someone else's library. But once you're done here, you can either navigate back with Alt, Left, and Right. But since these aren't my files and I don't really want them to stay open, you can just Control W, Control W, Control W, and now we're back here at the main application. So the F12 navigation is not only good for navigating through your code, but if you don't feel like looking up the documentation, usually you can come in here and see the documentation for the function you're trying to use. To give you another example of a useful thing with F12, and looking at the definition of your code is you can see the doc string. So if we import something from the JSON library, this is going to be load s. Doc string for this actually describes what it is and how to use it. So if we F12, we can come in here and actually look at the help files. And you can also look at the variables that this is expecting you to use when you call it. So if you don't know how to call a function, sometimes you can just push F12 and go look at it and figure out how to do it. And it also displays the doc string which will normally be showed in VS Code. So when you hover over this, you see that this is the same information that we were just looking at. It's just a little bit nicer. So if you mouse over it, you can read it and figure it out. But in VS Code, you also have the option of F12ing. If you're trying to figure out what a function is doing, you just F12 to it, take a look at what it is doing, and this will improve your ability to use it. So for our 10th item, this one may not be used by everyone, but if you do need to access a Linux system, the best way that I know how to do it is from VS Code. So normally if you're on Windows, you have to install a terminal like PuTTY to SSH into something. The Linux and Mac will have default SSH capabilities from their terminal. However, you don't get the full IDE at that point are working from a terminal. But with VS Code, you can actually SSH into a remote machine and connect to it. And then everything that you need will be running. So in order to do this, all you have to do is go over to your extensions and search for WSL. And then the WSL add-on and click install. This will allow you to directly connect to your WSL Linux machines on Windows. And then the other one is SSH. If you need to SSH to a remote Linux machine, you're going to want to install this. Both of these extensions are accessed from this icon on the bottom left corner, open a remote window. From here, you can either connect to an existing distro or you can connect to host with SSH. You can also create a configuration file. For this case, I'm running WSL, so this is gonna be easy. I'm just gonna open a new WSL window, and then we are now inside of our Linux machine. So you can see this is where I've been working normally is in my WSL window, and that's really it for WSL. If you're going to SSH into something, you need to know the IP address. It's probably port 22. And then you're going to need a username and password to log into that Linux machine. And if it's not using password, then there's going to be some sort of authentication token. But that's getting kind of outside of the scope of this. So the next thing I want to look at is actually Python virtual environments. And you can see I'm already running mine with this, this .vnv. 
But you see here, this is my virtual environment, and it's just a directory inside of my project. Okay, so what I just did was I deleted my virtual environment so we can create a new one. So we're back in our terminal without our virtual environment active, and it's been deleted. And the reason you want to use virtual environments is for installing other people's code like Fast API. Basically, once you stop using the standard library in Python and you're using someone else's code that you use a pip install to get access to, you want to start using a virtual environment. And the way that I do this on Windows would just be Python. On Linux, it's going to be Python 3 M uh, V E N V. So V E N V is the, the default virtual environment manager in Python. And then we need to give it a name. You can name it anything you want, but I always just use .env, and within this project, that will be the virtual environment for this project. You can see when we create this, now we have a new folder here called .env. Visual Studio Code is going to ask us if we want to use that. Yes, we do. So now you can see your virtual environment for Python is always selected down here on the bottom right, and we've actually selected our .env file in our current directory. And from this terminal, we're not yet in the virtual environment because when you are, it shows up on the left side of the terminal. So what we need to do is just go into our uh, folder and run it. So in Linux, you're going to use source.venv uh, bin activate. So this is a script that actually activates this virtual environment. And now you can see at the beginning of our terminal that we are inside the virtual environment. From here, we can do things like pip install fast API. And now when it installs FastAPI, it's installing it into our virtual environment and our host machine is not affected by this virtual environment. This allows you to keep the Python environment on your main machine clean and free of all of these different dependencies. Because once you start installing a lot of different dependencies, they can have conflicts between different versions. Things can stop working. It can be very hard to maintain. You want to have an environment for every project that you're going to create. The final item that we're going to look at is the linter and the formatter. So again, all we have to do is go over here to the extensions area. So we're going to use Flake 8 as our formatter. I don't know if PyLint is still terrible. If you have it and it works for you, that's great. Just leave it alone. But I, I always go here and I install Flake 8. And then the other thing that's needed is AutoPep 8. So AutoPep 8 will enforce formatting on your documentation. That's where you see the formatter Let's talk about the difference here. So the linter is for errors. For our linter, if we create an error here, like why is not defined, and then we look at it, it just says, you know, why is not defined. It's both, you know, PyLance is yelling at us and Flakegate is also yelling at us. But then we can get rid of this. And once your formatter is active, like this code now works. There's nothing wrong with it. If we press F5, it actually runs and there's no problem. But you can see we're getting an error here, and this is because it's expecting two blank lines after a function definition, which strange enough, uh, flake gate is the thing that's yelling at us, but we can use our formatter. If you right click and go to format document, or even better, go to format document, notice that it says shift alt F. Let's get out of here, press shift alt F. And now it's going to ask us if we want to install our formatter into our project. I'm gonna say yes. Just because it's installed in VS Code doesn't mean it's installed in your project. So this installed it into our virtual environment. Now we have our formatter, Shift-Alt-F, and you can see that it automatically moved this down a line and got rid of that error. So formatting errors also come up, which is kind of why this last item may not be for beginners. So if you're just learning to code and you're leaving one space everywhere and then all of a sudden your environment is yelling at you with these errors it take it can take a long time to learn how to format your code properly and avoid those from coming up in the first place and when i'm first learning to code like i don't want errors where there are not errors these are this is saying it's an error because the document is not formatted properly and it looks the same as an error so if you just shift alt f and save it's going to get rid of all of those for you but when you're new and you don't know why there's an error here, I expected two blank lines, like, okay, let's add a blank line here and a blank line there. Does that fix it? What if we do three blank lines? Oh, well, that's too many blank lines. It expected two, but we have three. See, too many blank lines. So you can see that it just is kind of problematic. 
Once you're working on a larger project or a larger code base, especially if there are multiple people in there, you want to have a standard for code formatting. But this last one really is pretty optional for new programmers. When you're ready to have your code look consistent, it's time to start using uh, the formatter and the linter more seriously. And you probably noticed the bonus big brain tip. It's kind of been hinted at throughout here. Every time you see a shortcut, so let's say I wanted to rename the symbol. Of course, we already know that one, F2. So instead of going to the menu and doing it, you just press F2. If I wanted to format my code, I don't right click and format my document. I press, I see that, I back out, I control shift F, and now my document is formatted. So every time I do something in VS Code, mouse over it for a minute, see if it has a shortcut. And instead of clicking on that thing, put the mouse down and actually type the shortcut in. If you do that every single time, initially you're gonna be a little slow, but in the long term, you're gonna be extremely fast. You're gonna know all sorts of insane shortcuts. You will be a VS Code wizard. All right, if you made it this far in the video, please hit that like and subscribe button. It really is the best way to support the channel. And at this point, you should have learned a lot of tips to make you a better programmer in VS Code. Thanks for watching, see you next time.